the protocols of the learned elders of Zion is a fabricated anti-Semitic text purporting to describe a Jewish plan for global domination. It is a form of what can be called black propaganda, which, to quote Wikipedia, is a form of propaganda intended to create the impression that it was created by those it is supposed to discredit. Black propaganda contrasts with gray propaganda, which does not identify its source, and white propaganda, which does not disguise its origins at all. It is typically used to vilify or embarrass the enemy through misrepresentation. The major characteristic of black propaganda is that the audience are not aware that someone is influencing them and do not feel that they are being pushed in a certain direction. Black propaganda purports to emanate from a source other than the true source. This type of propaganda is associated with covert psychological operations. Sometimes the source is concealed or credited to a false authority and spreads lies, fabrications, and deceptions. Black propaganda is the big lie, including all types of creative deceit. Black propaganda relies on the willingness of the receiver to accept the credibility of the source. If the creators or senders of the black propaganda message do not adequately understand their intended audience, the message may be misunderstood, seem suspicious, or fail altogether. By disguising their direct involvement, a government may be more likely to succeed in convincing an otherwise unbelieving target audience. Black propaganda is necessary to obfuscate a government's involvement in activities that may be detrimental to its foreign policies. End quote. In short, and again to block quote Wikipedia, the Protocols is a fabricated document purporting to be factual. Most versions substantially involve protocols or minutes of a speech given in secret involving Jews that are organized as elders or sages of Zion and outlines 24 protocols that are supposedly followed by the Jewish people. The protocols has been proven to be a literary forgery and hoax, as well as a clear case of plagiarism. The protocols is one of the best known and most discussed examples of literary forgery, with analysis and proof of its fraudulent origin dating as far back as 1921. The forgery is an early example of conspiracy theory literature. Written mainly in the first person plural, the text includes generalizations, truisms, and platitudes on how to take over the world. Take control of the media and the financial institutions, change the traditional social order, etc. Source material for the forgery consisted jointly of Dialogue in Hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, an 1864 political satire by Maurice Jolie, and a chapter from Biarritz an 1868 novel by the anti-Semitic German novelist Hermann Gosch, which had been translated into Russian in 1872. A major inspirational source for the Protocols was Der Judenstadt, 1896, by Theodore Herzl, which was referred to as Zionist Protocols in its initial French and Russian editions. Der Judenstadt, German, 
literally, the Jews' state, is a pamphlet written by Theodore Herzl and published in February 1896 in Leipzig and Vienna by M. Breitensteins Verlags Buchenlang. It is subtitled, Proposal of a Modern Solution for the Jewish Question, and was originally called Address to the Rothschilds, referring to the Rothschild family banking dynasty, as Herzl planned to, to deliver it as a speech to the Rothschild family. Baron Edmund de Rothschild rejected Herzl's plan, feeling that it threatened Jews in the diaspora. He also thought it would put his own settlements at risk. It is considered one of the most important texts of early Zionism. As expressed in this book, Herzl envisioned the founding of a future independent Jewish state during the 20th century. He argued that the best way to avoid anti-Semitism in Europe was to create this independent Jewish state. The book encouraged Jews to purchase land in Palestine, although the possibility of a Jewish state in Argentina is also considered. The Dialogue in Hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu is a political satire written by French attorney Maurice Joly in protest against the regime of Napoleon III, a.k.a. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, who ruled France from 1848 until 1870. It was translated into English in 2002. The piece uses the literary device of a dialogue of the dead, invented by ancient Roman writer Lucian, and introduced into the French Belle Lettre by Bernard de Fontenelle in the 18th century. Shadows of the historical characters of Niccolo Machiavelli and Charles Montesquieu meet in hell in the year 1864 and dispute on politics. In this way, Jolie tried to cover up a direct and then illegal criticism of Louis Napoleon's rule. Jolie relates in his 1870 autobiography, the noble Baron Montesquieu would make the case for liberalism. The Florentine politician Machiavelli would present the case for despotism. The book was published anonymously by a contemporary in Brussels in 1864 and smuggled into France for distribution, but the print run was seized by the police immediately upon crossing the border. The police swiftly tracked down its author and Jolie was arrested. The book was banned. On 25th April 1865, Jolie was sentenced to 18 months at the St. Pelagier prison in Paris. The second edition of Dialogues was issued in 1868 under Jolie's name. Italian writer Umberto Eco claimed in 1994 that in the dialogue Jolie plagiarized seven pages or more from a popular novel, Les Mystery de People, by Eugene Sue. The Mysteries of Paris is a novel by the French writer Eugene Sue. It was published serially in 90 parts in Journal 
de Debay from 19 June 1842 until 15 October 1843, making it one of the first serial novels published in France. It was an instant success and single-handedly increased the circulation of Journal de Debay. It founded the city mysteries genre, spawning many imitations. Sue was the first author to bring together so many characters from different levels of society within one novel, and thus his book was popular with readers from all classes. Its realistic descriptions of the poor and disadvantaged became a critique of social institutions. The novel is a melodramatic depiction of a world where good and evil are clearly distinct. Rodolphe, the prince, embodies good. Ferrand, a lawyer and representative of a new commercial order, embodies evil. The novel was partly inspired by the memoirs, 1828, of Eugene Francois Vidor, a French criminal and criminalist whose life story inspired several other writers, including Victor Hugo in Les Miserables and Henri de Balzac. Its greatest inspiration, stylistically, was the works of James Fenimore Cooper. Sue took the plot structure of the Natty Bumpo novels and moved them to the city where buildings replaced trees and underworld gangs replaced Indians. The most extended criticism of the novel was by Karl Marx, who discussed it in the Holy Family, 1845. Marx used the novel to attack the young Hegelians who he thought advocated a too simplistic view of reality. Marx found Sue unintentionally making a mockery of mystery, turning character into caricature. Edgar Allan Poe wrote an essay about the novel, published in his 1908 Complete Works. He considers the incidents that follow the premise to be credible, but that the premise itself is laughably impossible. The original novel was very long, in some editions over a thousand pages. The earliest known English translation by J.D. Smith concerned a 1844 three-volume edition. Herman Goethe's 1868 novel, Biarritz, to Sedan, contains a chapter called The Jewish Cemetery in Prague and the Council of Representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel. In it, Goch, who was unaware that only two of the original twelve biblical tribes remained, depicts a clandestine nocturnal meeting of members of a mysterious rabbinical cabal that is planning a diabolical Jewish conspiracy. At midnight, the devil appears to contribute his opinions and insight. The chapter closely resembles a scene in Alexandre Dumas' Giuseppe Balsamo, 1848, in which Joseph Balsamo, a.k.a. Alessandro Cogliostro, and company, plot the Affair of the Diamond Necklace. Fictional events in Jolie's dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, which appeared four years before Biarritz, may well have been the inspiration for Gauche's fictional Midnight Meeting and details of the outcome of the supposed plot. Goethe's 
chapter may have been an outright plagiarism of Jolie, Dumas, or both. Norman Cohn notes in Warrant for Genocide, 1966 and 1967, quote, In all, over 160 passages in the Protocols, totaling two-fifths of the entire text, are clearly based on passages in Jolie. In nine of the chapters, the borrowings amount to more than half the text. In some, they amount to three quarters. In one, Protocol 7, to almost the entire text. This should be enough to demonstrate that plagiarism occurred. End quote. Identifiable phrases from Joe Lee constitute 4% of the first half of the first edition and 12% of the second half. Later editions, including most translations, have longer quotes from Joe Lee. The Protocols 1 through 19 closely follow the order of Maurice Jolie's Dialogues 1 through 17. Philip Graves, 1876 until 1953, brought this plagiarism to light in a series of articles in The Times in 1921 being the first to expose the protocols as a forgery to the public. In 1920 and 1921, the history of the concepts found in the protocols was traced back to the works of Gauche and Jacques Cretineau Jolie by Lucien Wolff, an English-Jewish journalist, and published in London in August. 1921. But a dramatic expose occurred in the series of articles in The Times by its Constantinople reporter Philip Graves, who discovered the plagiarism from the work of Maurice Jolie. The chapter in the Jewish Cemetery in Prague from Goethe's Biarritz with its strong anti-Semitic theme, containing the alleged rabbinical plot against the European civilization, was translated into Russian as a separate pamphlet in 1872. In 1921, Princess Catherine Radziwill gave a private lecture in New York in which she claimed that the protocols were a forgery compiled in 1904 and 5 by Russian journalists Matvey Golovinsky and Manashevis Mulinov at the direction of Pyotr Ratchovsky, chief of the Russian Secret Service in Paris. This seems to have been based on a 1905 secret investigation ordered by Peter Stjolpin, the chairman of the Council of Ministers, that came to the conclusion that the Protocols first appeared in Paris in anti-Semitic circles around 1897 to 98. According to writer Peter Gross, Alan Dulles, who was in Constantinople, developing relationships in post-Ottoman political structures, discovered the source of the documentation and ultimately provided him to the Times. Gross writes that the Times extended a loan to the source, a Russian emigre who refused to be identified, with the understanding the loan would not be repaid. Colin Holmes, a lecturer in economic history at Sheffield University, identified the emigre as Mikhail Raslovlev, 
a self-identified anti-Semite. Dulles, then a successful lawyer and career diplomat, later member of the OSS and first civilian director of intelligence of the U.S. CIA, attempted to persuade the U.S. State Department to publicly denounce the forgery, but without success. Caesar G. de Michelais argues that the protocols was manufactured in the months after a Russian Zionist Congress in September 1902, and that it was originally a parody of Jewish idealism meant for internal circulation among anti-Semites until it was decided to clean it up and publish it as if it were real. Self-contradictions in various testimonies show that the individuals involved including the text's initial publisher, Pavel Khrushchev, deliberately obscured the origins of the text and lied about it in the decades afterwards. If the placement of the forgery in 1902 to 1903 Russia is correct, then it was written at the beginning of the anti-Jewish pogroms in the Russian Empire in which thousands of Jews were killed or fled the country. Many of the people whom de Michelais suspects of involvement in the forgery were directly responsible for inciting the pogroms. Towards the end of the 18th century, following the partitions of Poland, the Russian Empire inherited the world's largest Jewish population. The Jews lived in shtetls in the west of the empire, in the Pale of Settlement, and until the 1840s, local Jewish affairs were organized through the Kohal, the semi-autonomous Jewish government, including for purposes of taxation and conscription into the imperial Russian army. Following the ascent of liberalism in Europe, the Russian ruling class became more hardline in its reactionary policies, upholding the banner of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, whereby non-orthodox and non-Russian subjects, including Jews, were not always embraced. Resentment towards Jews, for the aforementioned reasons, existed in Russian society, but the idea of a protocols-esque international Jewish conspiracy for world domination was originally minted in the 1860s. Jacob Brofman, a Russian Jew from Minsk, had a falling out with agents of the local Kohal, and consequently turned against Judaism. He subsequently converted to the Russian Orthodox Church and authored polemics against the Talmud and the Quahal. Brofman claimed in his books The Local and Universal Jewish Brotherhoods, 1868, and The Book of the Kahal, 1869, published in Vilna, that the Quahal continued to exist in secret and that it had as its principal aim undermining Christian entrepreneurs, taking over their property, and ultimately seizing power. He also claimed that it was an international conspiratorial network under the central control of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was based in Paris and then under the leadership of Adolphe Cremieux, a prominent Freemason. The Vilna Talmudist Jacob Barit attempted to refute Brafman's claim 
Aside from Brafman, there were other early writings which posited a similar concept to the Protocols. In 1872, a Russian translation of The Jewish Cemetery in Prague appeared in St. Petersburg as a separate pamphlet of purported nonfiction. The Conquest of the World by the Jews, 1878, was published in Basel and authored by Osman Bey, born Frederick Mellingen. Mellingen was a British subject and son of English physician Julius Michael Mellingen, but served as an officer in the Ottoman Empire where he was born. He converted to Islam, but later became a Russian Orthodox Christian. Bay's work was followed up by Hippolytus Lutostansky's The Talmud and the Jews, 1879, which claimed the Jews wanted to divide Russia amongst themselves. The Protocols appeared in print in the Russian Empire as early as 1903, published as a series of articles in Znamya, a Black Hundreds newspaper owned by Pavel Khrushchevan. It appeared again in 1905 as the final chapter, chapter 12, of the second edition of The Great in the Small and Antichrist, a book by Sergei Nihilus. In 1906, it appeared in pamphlet form, edited by Georgi Butmi de Katzman. These first three, and subsequently more, Russian language imprints were published and circulated in the Russian Empire during the 1903 to 1906 period as a tool for scapegoating Jews, blamed by the monarchists for the defeat in the Russian-Japanese War and the Revolution of 1905. As the Russian Revolution unfolded, causing white movement-affiliated Russians to flee to the West, this text was carried along and assumed a new purpose. Until then, the protocols had remained obscure. It now became an instrument for blaming Jews for the Russian Revolution. It became a political weapon used against the Bolsheviks, who were depicted as overwhelmingly Jewish, allegedly executing the plan embodied in the protocols. The purpose was to discredit the October Revolution of 1917, prevent the West from recognizing the Soviet Union, and bring about the downfall of Vladimir Lenin's regime. In his book, The Non-Existent Manuscript, Italian scholar Cesare G. de Michelis studies early Russian publications of the Protocols. The Protocols were first mentioned in the Russian press in April 1902 by the St. Petersburg newspaper Novoye Vremna, The New Times. The article was written by famous conservative publicist Mikhail Menshikov as a part of his regular series Letters to Neighbors, and was titled Plots Against Humanity. The author described his meeting with a lady, Yuliana Glinka, it is now known, who, after telling him about her mystical revelations, implored him to get familiar with the documents later known as the Protocols, but after reading some excerpts, Menshikov became quite skeptical about their origin and did not publish them. The protocols were published at the earliest in serialized form from August 28th 
to September 7th, O.S. 1903, in Znamya, a St. Petersburg daily newspaper, under Pavel Khrushchevan. Khrushchevan had initiated the Kishinev pogrom four months earlier. In 1905, Sergei Nihilus published the full text of the Protocols in Chapter 12, the final chapter, pages 305 to 417 of the second edition of his book, The Great Within the Small, The Coming of the Antichrist, and the Rule of Satan on Earth. In this work, Nihilus stated, quote, The person who gave me this manuscript guaranteed it to be a faithful translation of the original documents that were stolen by a woman from one of the highest and most influential leaders of the Freemasons at a secret meeting somewhere in France. End quote. Ukrainian scholar Vadim Skoratovsky offers extensive literary, historical, and linguistic analysis of the original text of the Protocols and traces the influences of Fyodor Dostoevsky's prose, in particular The Grand Inquisitor and The Possessed, on Golovinsky's writings, including the Protocols. The Protocols also appeared in 1919 in the public ledger as a pair of serialized newspaper articles, but all references to Jews were replaced with references to Bolsheviki as an expose by the journalist and subsequently highly respected Columbia University School of Journalism Dean Carl W. Ackerman. Umberto Eco also dealt with the Protocols in 1994 in Chapter 6, Fictional Protocols, of his Six Walks in the Fictional Woods, and in his 2010 novel, The Cemetery of Prague. Since the Protocols are presented as merely a document, the front matter and back matter are needed to explain its alleged origin. The diverse imprints, however, are mutually inconsistent. The general claim is that the document was stolen from a secret Jewish organization. Since the alleged original stolen manuscript does not exist, one is forced to restore a purported original edition. This has been done by the Italian scholar Cesar G. de Mechelis in 1998 in a work which was translated into English and published in 2004, where he treats his subject as apocrypha, a dystopia is often treated as an antonym of utopia, a term that was coined by Sir Thomas More and figures as the title of his best-known work published in 1516, which created a blueprint for an ideal society with minimal crime, violence, and poverty. Dystopias are often characterized by dehumanization, tyrannical governments, environmental disaster, or other characteristics associated with a cataclysmic decline in society. Dystopian societies appear in many fictional works and artistic representations, particularly in stories set in the future. The best known is George Orwell's 1984. Other famous examples are Aldous 
Huxley's Brave New World, 1932, and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, 1953. In the novel Brave New World, written in 1931 by Aldous Huxley, a class system is prenatally determined with alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, and epsilons, with the lower classes having reduced brain function and special conditioning to make them satisfied with their position in life. In Brave New World, where children are reproduced artificially, the concepts of mother and father are considered obscene. In Brave New World, the lower class is conditioned to be afraid of nature. One of the earliest examples of this theme is Robert Hugh Benson's 1907 Lord of the World about a futuristic world where the Freemasons have taken over the world and the only other religion left is a Roman Catholic minority. In 1899's When the Sleeper Wakes H.G. Wells depicted the governing class as hedonistic and shallow. George Orwell contrasted Wells' world to that depicted in Jack London's The Iron Heel, where the dystopian rulers are brutal and dedicated to the point of fanaticism, which Orwell considered more plausible. Dystopian political situations are depicted in novels such as We, Parable of the Sower, Darkness at Noon, 1984, Brave New World, The Hunger Games, Divergent, and Fahrenheit 451 and such films as Metropolis, Brazil, Battle Royale, FAQ Frequently Asked Questions, Soylent Green, Logan's Run, and The Running Man. A theme is the dichotomy of planned economies versus free market economies, a conflict which is found in such works as Ayn Rand's Anthem and Henry Kuttner's short story The Iron Standard. Another example of this is reflected in Norman Jewison's 1975 film Rollerball. Kurt Vonnegut's Player Piano depicts a dystopia in which the centrally controlled economic system has indeed made material abundance plentiful, but deprived the mass of humanity of meaningful labor. In some dystopian works, such as Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, Society forces individuals to conform to radical egalitarian social norms that discourage or suppress accomplishment or even competence as forms of inequality. Other works feature extensive privatization and corporatism. This is seen in the novels Jennifer Government and Oryx, and Crake, and the movies Alien, Avatar, Robocop, Visioneers, Idiocracy, Soylent Green, THX 1138, Wall E, 
and rollerball. Corporate republics are common in the cyberpunk genre, as in Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash and Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, as well as the film Blade Runner, influenced by and based upon Dick's novel. Violence is prevalent in many dystopias, often in the form of war, but also in urban crimes led by predominantly teenage gangs, e.g. A Clockwork Orange, or rampant crime met by blood sports, e.g. Battle Royale, The Running Man, The Hunger Games, and Divergent. Excessive pollution that destroys nature is common in many dystopian films such as The Matrix, Robocop, Wall-E, April and the Extraordinary World, and Soylent Green. Apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction is a subgenre of science fiction science fantasy, dystopia, or horror, in which the Earth's civilization is collapsing or has collapsed. The apocalypse event may be climatic, such as runaway climate change, astronomical, such as an impact event, destructive, such as nuclear holocaust or resource depletion, medical, such as a pandemic, whether natural or human caused, end time, such as the last judgment, second coming, or Ragnarok, or more imaginative, such as a zombie apocalypse, cybernetic revolt, technological singularity, dysgenics, or alien invasion. The story may involve attempts to prevent an apocalypse event, deal with the impact and consequences of the event itself, or it may be post-apocalyptic, set after the event. The time may be directly after the catastrophe, focusing on the psychology of survivors, the way to keep the human race alive and together as one, or considerably later, often including that the existence of pre-catastrophe civilization has been mythologized. Post-apocalyptic stories often take place in a non-technological future world, or a world where only scattered elements of society and technology remain. Various ancient societies, including the Babylonian and Judaic, produced apocalyptic literature and mythology, which dealt with the end of the world and of human society, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, written circa 2000 to 1500 BC. Recognizable Modern apocalyptic novels have existed since at least the first third of the 19th century when Mary Shelley's The Last Man, 1826, was published. However, this form of literature gained widespread popularity after World War II, when the possibility of global annihilation by nuclear weapons entered the public consciousness. The year 1816 was known as the Year Without a Summer because Mount Tambora had erupted in the Dutch East Indies in 1815 that emitted sulfur into the atmosphere that lowered the temperature and altered weather patterns throughout the world. This was the source for Lord Byron's poem, Darkness. 
included in the Prisoner of Chillon collection, on the apocalyptic end of the world and one man's survival, was one of the earliest English language works in this genre. The sun was blotted out, leading to darkness and cold, which kills off mankind through famine and ice age conditions. The poem was influential in the emergence of the last man theme, which appeared in the works of several poets, such as The Last Man by Thomas Campbell, 1824, and The Last Man, 1826, by Thomas Hood, as well as The Last Man by Thomas Lovell Beddoes. Mary Shelley's novel, The Last Man, 1826, is a continuation of the apocalyptic theme in fiction. The story follows a group of people as they struggle to survive in a plague-infected world. The story centers on a male protagonist as he struggles to keep his family safe but is inevitably left as the last man alive. Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Conversation of Iros and Charmion, 1839, follows the conversation between two souls in the afterlife as they discuss the destruction of the world. The destruction was brought about by a comet that removed nitrogen from Earth's atmosphere. This left only oxygen and resulted in a worldwide inferno. H.G. Wells wrote several novels that have a post-apocalyptic theme. The Time Machine, 1895, has the unnamed protagonist traveling to the year 802,701 A.D. after civilization has collapsed and humanity has split into two distinct species, the elfin Eloi and the brutal Morlocks. Later in the story, the time traveler moves forward to a dying earth beneath a swollen red sun. The War of the Worlds, 1898, depicts an invasion of Earth by inhabitants of the planet Mars. The aliens systematically destroy Victorian England with advanced weaponry mounted on nearly indestructible vehicles. Due to the infamous radio adaptation of the novel by Orson Welles on his show The Mercury Theatre on the Air, the novel has become one of the best-known early apocalyptic works. A self-fulfilling prophecy is the socio-psychological phenomenon of someone predicting or expecting something, and this prediction or expectation coming true simply because the person believes it will and the person's resulting behaviors align to fulfill this belief. This suggests that people's beliefs influence their actions. The principle behind this phenomenon is that people create consequences regarding people or events based on previous knowledge of the subject. Many myths, legends, and fairy tales make use of this motif as a central element of narratives that are designed to illustrate inexorable fate fundamental to the Hellenic worldview. In Greek literature, a prophet is defined as one who speaks for another. In such examples as Oedipus, Perseus, and the Lydian king Croesus, or Romulus and Remus, the prophecy prompts someone to action because he is led to expect a favorable result. 
but instead he achieves another disastrous result which nonetheless fulfills the prophecy. Blacklisting is the action of a group or authority compiling a list of people, countries, or other entities to be avoided or distrusted as being deemed unacceptable to those making the list. If someone is on a blacklist, they are seen by a government or other organization as being one of a number of people who cannot be trusted or who have done something wrong. As a verb, blacklist can mean to put an individual or entity on such a list. Censorship is the suppression of speech, public communication, or other information on the basis that such material is considered objectionable, harmful, sensitive, or inconvenient. Censorship can be conducted by governments, private institutions, and other controlling bodies, occurs in a variety of different media, including speech, books, music, films, and other arts, the press, radio, television, and the internet for a variety of claimed reasons including national security, to control obscenity, child pornography, and hate speech, to protect children or other vulnerable groups, to promote or restrict political or religious views, and to prevent slander and libel. Direct censorship may or may not be legal, depending on the type, location, and content. Many countries provide strong protections against censorship by law, but none of these protections are absolute, and frequently a claim of necessity to balance conflicting rights is made in order to determine what could and could not be censored. There are no laws against self-censorship. Book censorship is the act of some authority taking measures to suppress ideas and information within a book. Books can be censored by burning shelf removal, school censorship, and banning books. Similarly, religions may issue lists of banned books, such as the historical example of the Roman Catholic Church's Index Librorum Prohibitorum, and bans of such books as the Satanic Verses, by Ayatollah Khomeini. Similarly, books based on the scriptures have also been banned, such as Leo Tolstoy's The Kingdom of God is Within You, which was banned in the Russian Empire for being anti-establishment. Governments have also sought to ban certain books which they perceive to contain material that could threaten embarrass or criticize them. Banning of a book often has the effect of enticing people to seek the book. The action of banning a book creates an interest in the book which has the opposite effect of making the work more popular. The Index Librorum Prohibitorum list of prohibited books was a list of publications deemed heretical or contrary to morality by the sacred congregation of the index a former dicastery of the roman 
Curia, and Catholics were forbidden to read them without permission. There were attempts to censor individual books before the 16th century, notably the 9th century Decretum Glacianum, but none of these were either official or widespread. In 1559, Pope Paul IV promulgated the Pauline Index. Pope Paul IV established the Index of Prohibited Books, which banned thousands of book titles and blacklisted publications, including the works of Europe's intellectual elites. This index condemned religious texts, readings of romance, and graded authors based on their degree of toxicity. The stated aim of the list was to protect the faith and morals of the faithful by preventing the reading of theologically, culturally, or politically disruptive books. While it has been described by some as the turning point for the freedom of inquiry in the Catholic world, the effects of the index were minimal and it was largely ignored. After less than a year, it was replaced by the Tridentine Index, which relaxed aspects of the Pauline Index that had been criticized and had prevented its acceptance. The twentieth and final edition appeared in 1948 and the index was formally abolished on 14th June 1966 by Pope Paul VI. Damnatio Memoriae is a modern Latin phrase meaning condemnation of memory, indicating that a person is to be excluded from official accounts. There are and have been many routes to damnatio memori, including the destruction of depictions, the removal of names from inscriptions and documents, and even large-scale rewritings of history. The term can be applied to other instances of official scrubbing. The practice is seen as long ago as the aftermath of the reign of the Egyptian pharaohs Akhenaten in the 13th century BC and Hatshepsut in the 14th century BC. Although the term Damnatio Memori is Latin. The phrase was not used by the ancient Romans and first appeared in a dissertation written in Germany in 1689. The term is used in modern scholarship to cover a wide array of official and unofficial sanctions through which the physical remnants and memories of a deceased individual are destroyed. One example of damnatio memori, or oblivion, as a punishment, was meted out by the peoples of Ephesus after Herostratus, a 4th century BC Greek arsonist, set fire to the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of antiquity. Felons would be erased from history for the crimes they had committed. Egyptians also practiced this, as seen in relics from Akhenaten's tomb and elsewhere. His worship restricted to the one god, Aten, instead of the many gods common to the time, was considered heretical. During his reign, Akhenaten himself attempted to have all references to the god Amun 
chipped away to stop the worship of that god. After his reign, temples to the Aten were dismantled, and the stones reused to create other temples. Images of Akhenaten had their faces chipped away, and images and references to Amun reappeared. The people blamed their misfortunes on Akhenaten's shift of worship to Atenism, away from the gods they served before him. The sense of the expression, damnatio memori, and of the sanction is to remove every trace of the person from life as if they had never existed, in order to preserve the honor of the city. In ancient Rome, the practice of damnatio memori was the condemnation of Roman elites and emperors after their deaths. If the Senate, or a later emperor, did not like the acts of an individual, they could have his property seized, his name erased, and his statues reworked. Because there is an economic incentive to seize property and rework statues, historians and archaeologists have had difficulty determining when official damnatio memori actually took place. Homo sacer, Latin for the sacred man or the accursed man, is a figure of Roman law, a person who is banned and may be killed by anybody, but may not be sacrificed in a religious ritual. The homo sacer could thus also simply mean a person expunged from society and deprived of all rights and all functions in civil religion. Homo sacer is defined in legal terms as someone who can be killed without the killer being regarded as a murderer and a person who cannot be sacrificed. The sacred human may thus be understood as someone outside the law or beyond it. With respect to certain monarchs in certain Western legal traditions, the concepts of the sovereign and of the homo sacer have been conflated. A direct reference to this status is found in the Twelve Tables, 8.21. Laws of the Early Roman Republic, written in the 5th century B.C. The paragraph states that a patron who deceives his clients is to be regarded as saker. The status of homo saker could fall upon one as a consequence of oath-breaking. An oath, in antiquity, was essentially a conditional self-cursing, i.e. invoking one or several deities and asking for their punishment in the event of breaking the oath. An oath-breaker was consequently considered the property of the gods whom he had invoked and then deceived. If the oath-breaker was killed, this was understood as the revenge of the gods into whose power he had given himself. Since the oath-breaker was already the property of the oath-deity, he could no longer belong to human society or be consecrated to another deity. The idea of the status of an outlaw, a criminal who is declared as unprotected by the law and can consequently be killed by anyone with impunity, persists throughout the Middle Ages. 
medieval perception condemned the entire human intrinsic moral worth of the outlaw, dehumanizing the outlaw literally as a wolf or wolf's head. In an era where hunting of wolves existed strongly, including a commercial element, and is first revoked only by the English Habeas Corpus Act of 1679, which declares that any criminal must be judged by a tribunal before being punished. 